miss anything? No. Uh, I was uh, doing an interview out, uh, out in the back there, and it was uh, fascinating. It was the Jackson Free Press. And, uh, you know, actually the questions were kind, and uh, there are a lot of issues we disagree on, obviously, but I love that we can have these conversations. It's just like when I was able to appear on Morning Joe. People say, why did you appear on Morning Joe? And the answer is, I'm here to fight. I'm here to fight. And we can't always just fight on our turf. We sometimes have to fight on their turf as well. So You're that's great on that too, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. I stand by every word. <laughs> I stand by every word. You're I'm not breaking down. Absolutely. And you know, it's funny, uh, just to address that just for a second, you know, I, you saw all the national uproar about what I said. Did you notice nobody ever answered the question? A hundred years of Mississippi begging for scraps. And where are we? They what, run from the truth. What, right, why didn't anybody answer the question? Yeah. It was a national outrage, but nobody got right to the heart of why we're still dead last. And one of the reasons is we have an economic system that's backwards. And it's backwards because of too much government, not too little government. So I stand by. Now, with all that said, I appreciate y'all being here. I, um, I, I received the endorsement tonight, and that means a lot to me, obviously. I've known all of you. You're like my family members. I see the same faces, the same people, and I'm very, very honored. I'm very honored. I, um, these are days we'll never forget. And I, I go back to 2014, and you might remember the first night that we ran and were successful against Senator Cochran. I think we had 49.7% of the vote, 49.6% of the vote. And I remember all the happy faces in that room. And that stayed with me all that time. And three weeks later, we came back and we saw them do the unspeakable. And then I remember all the tears in the room. And that stayed with me the whole time. And, Throughout all of this course of history, we've lost some friends. We've lost some people that we love very much. But here we are again. And I say it seriously that you all are like my family. Mm -hmm. I'm an only child, so I always reached out to others. I, I have uh, aunts and uncles that aren't blood at all. I have brothers and sisters that aren't blood at all. That's just who I am. And I know you're among those, and it really means an awful lot to me. So thank you for that. Thank you, <laughs> Absolutely. You know, you know what's great? You know what's great about that? All of this venom they're throwing at us now. And we knew it was going to come. It always happens when you're over the target. They get a little insecure, a little bit scared, and so they have to attack. But you know what's funny? In all of those attacks, have they ever said I wasn't a conservative? In all of those attacks, have they ever said I wasn't a Republican? No, it's all these side issues. Here's why. They want you focused on the side issues. Because when you focus on the real issues, they can't defend their records. Amen. They can't defend them. <laughs> example after example of failure on the part of people that campaigned as conservatives but then governed as Democrats. And spectacular failure with Democrats that campaign like Democrats and try to govern like socialists. That party has lost its way. That party has lost its way. Now, if you know the party, the Democrats have lost their way and they're marching so far towards socialism, why should we follow them? We're not here to dance with those people. We're here to beat them. We're not here to compromise or to surrender to those people. We're here to defeat them because their ideas are dangerous to a free society. Bernie Sanders can't be anywhere near the White House. And thank God Hillary Clinton now is hopefully retired. Right. We, have, we have a responsibility to make sure that those types of philosophies remain retired because those philosophies are hostile to free people. And everything that we do and every speech that we give and every vote that we cast is to expand your individual liberty at the expense of the central government. It's gotten too big, it's gotten too complicated, and it's not the way it's supposed to be. We're here to make it right again. So I know you're doing that. And you see, you haven't seen anything yet. I'm going to tell you what's really cool. They have all that money. I want you to think about something for a second. Now, one poll has us up 8 to 10. You've seen that poll. There's another poll that's leaked out there that we hear we're up to. But they're celebrating. Now, get this. This is what's funny. How bad is the establishment? They've outspent us 20 to 1. Oh. And they're bragging about being up five points. 
No, some, something's in the air. Something's happening. And you know what that is? It's you. It's you. Sweat. All that money isn't moving the needle. All of those great fancy ads, it's not moving the needle. It's you. You're stopping the needle because you're walking doors, you're making phone calls, and you're on Facebook every night. You're stopping it all by yourselves. It's the same thing that happened with Trump. Jill Bush raised $100 million by traditional wisdom, conventional wisdom. Jill Bush would have been the nominee. And there was a time he was in first place, remember? There were like 15 candidates, and he was in first place. And everybody said, Jill Bush is going to be the next uh, Republican nominee. Well, guess what? The people stopped that momentum. They said, it's not going to happen, not on our watch. And they told us a thousand times that if you nominate Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton will be guaranteed to be our president. <laughs> well, what happened? Thank God for Donald Trump, right? <laughs> Thank God for Donald Trump. Here we are now. We're watching them attack us the same way they attacked him. Side issues, distractions, and lies. But here we are, still rising. All that money, all that venom, and they still can't stop us. That's you. That's the people. You did it for Trump in 16. You did it for me in 14. And by George, we're going to do it again right here in 18, right? Yeah. Me fired up. Forget the political speeches, right? <laughs> why don't we uh, why don't we do some Q and A real quick? Let's get to the bottom of some of these issues, and and that way I won't bore you with this with another old political speech. Instead, we'll just talk about the issues. Yes, Lord. I got a phone call today that I want you to explain. If it's from those telemarketers, I'm against it. No. <laughs> I have enough car insurance and health insurance. I don't need to hear from another telemarketer ever again. A gentleman I got the phone call from is right here in this room. Okay. And he went by his circuit clerk's office to pick up a sample ballot. And he noticed on the sample ballot that there is no name, there's no letters behind the names in the box. That's right. Where you are. Would That's you right. please explain that to all of us? Right. I explained it to Mr. Burkett, but you tell the rest of us. All right, here's the answer. So this is a special election. <laughs> and as a special election in this state, it's akin to Louisiana's jungle primary. What that means is all the candidates are lumped into one primary with no party affiliation. Also, and this is where the establishment is lying, and they're watching right now. They always log in and watch, and you're lying about this. <laughs> Here's the thing. They always say, well, listen, we can't split the vote. Everybody rush to Cindy's aid. We can't split the vote because SP will win. That is a lie, and they know it. Here's why. In a special primary election like this, the top two people advance. That's right. The top two candidates advance. Vote for the conservative. Vote for the only lifetime Republican. I'll advance, and SB still loses. You know what's funny? I say this seriously. I am the only Republican in this race. Yeah, yeah. That's right. And then their last argument, and it's the last refuge of scoundrels, isn't it? They say, well, you know, listen, um, Mike Espy might win this race. Let's not kid ourselves. Even Lucian Smith, who's the head of our party, has said very clearly that Mike Espy has absolutely no chance to win this race. If you know the numbers, if you know our state, there's no way Mississippi sends a former Clinton appointee who was too corrupt for the Clintons and had to step down back to Washington. That's not going to happen. And you know it's not going to happen, and they know it's not going to happen. The establishment knows it's not going to happen. But they say all that because they're always talking about side issues. They never want to address the real issues. Here are the real issues. The Republican Party, the party I love more than anything, is in control of this government, right? And we're still funding Planned Parenthood. And we're still funding sanctuary cities. And we're still funding Obamacare. And we're still running deficits and debts. And we still haven't built a border wall. Thank you. Now, those are the issues. Those are the issues. And until we address those issues, they're going to keep playing these games. And guess why they funded Obamacare? Because Cindy Highsmith voted to do that. Guess why they voted, voted uh, to fund sanctuary cities? Because she voted to do that. Guess why they voted to fund every other unimaginable and imaginable prospect the Democrats wanted? She voted for that. But now she's going to tell you she's really a conservative. 
No, she's not. She's a Democrat who works for Mitch McConnell, and there's a big difference there. Yes. Did Cindy Hyde Smith support all those things before she became a Republican? Of course. <laughs> so why is she talking? Of course. Now, yeah, here's the thing. Here's the other thing. So five years she spends as a federal lobbyist. There is nothing more injurious to our system right now than federal lobbyists. Five years in our system as a federal lobbyist lobbying for health care uh, reform that includes Obamacare and universal health care. That's who she lobbied for. She was a Democrat then. She came back to Mississippi, was elected as a Democrat, and she's still a Democrat. Why would we send a former federal lobbyist back to Washington, especially one that was hand-selected by the very swamp we claim we want to drain? Right. Now, if you're going to keep sending back swamp creatures, how are you going to drain it? Well, when are we going to start draining the swamp here in Mississippi? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I tell you what, I tell you what. We're going to win this thing on November the 6th, and then we're going to uh, beat whomever three weeks later. And we're going to spend the rest of our natural lives draining swamps everywhere we see a swamp. Yes. Now, see, now you're getting me fired up. Here we go. I do this from time to time. I can feel my blood pressure going up. We've allowed those people to create two systems of government. We've allowed those people to use the lobbyists and the special interest and the insiders to corrupt the government that's supposed to be there for us. But I'm going to tell you something. Your government's not listening to you. Those people aren't listening to you. They create a special privileged class of politicians. They go to Washington. They embrace the power and the lobbyists and the special interests, and they ignore you every day. You believe otherwise, try to get your U.S. senator on the telephone. You believe otherwise, try to see if they're responsive to your request. They send you these stupid form letters, don't they? We're tired of form letters. We want results. You told us you were going to fund the wall. Fund the wall. Yes. It's that simple, right? <laughs> but that's the system we've allowed them to create, a system that's disconnected from you, a system that's bought and sold by special interest and lobbyists. We've got to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And it begins by draining the swamp. How do you do that? One way, term limits, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why not? What do you have to lose? Bring them all home. Make them work for a change. Give them real jobs in the private sector for a change. I would trust any one of you to govern before I would trust those men and women. And why wouldn't we? That's the American ideal, is it not? That's who we are, is it not? So listen, you're getting me fired up, and I, I know I'm getting passionate. I want to see change. I want to see change. And if you won't change, I'm your guy. I promise you I'll bring it. I'll help bring it. Yes, sir? I have a comment or a question. So many people I talk to who are for hyphen Smith uh, say, well, Chris McDaniels has never done anything. Sure. Okay? And uh, they say, what has he done? What's he done to make Mississippi great? I'm just making a suggestion. Somehow, without tooting your horn too much, brother, yeah. uh, get the word out there in some sort of form. Yes, sir. Let's talk so, about it. I know you've got all that on your website, but these things yes, ain't going to go to your website. Well, well, let's talk about it for a second. So it's all right there, mcdaniel2018.com. mcdaniel2018.com. There's a results page there. I would encourage you to go click on it, and you'll see I have a long, long record of passing legislation in the state Senate. But there's also a bio there. This is something people always skip over. But you need to check it out because it goes right to the heart of some of the things I've done and then gives you some of the awards that I've won. I want you to think about this for a second. ACU's Award for Conservative Excellence, AFP's Champion of Freedom, highest lifetime score in the state from American Conservative Union, the Leader Call Legislator of the Year and Citizen of the Year, Mothers Against Drunk Driving Legislator of the Year, the Law Enforcement Officers Association Legislator of the Year, the Highway Patrol Legislator of the Year, Top uh, 50 lawyers in the state by the Mississippi Business Journal and a BIPEC champion 10 times. It's there. And when you hear all of this stuff, it's the more of the side issues. It's more of the side issues. I put my record up against anybody who served. You all have been there with me. You've seen me fight. You know what I've done. I put it up against anybody who served. The only thing that's been different is since I ran against Senator Cochran, the establishment's been trying to punish me behind the scenes. 
And you know how that works. They, they follow the legislation, and legislation that I've introduced, they try to kill behind the scenes. Well, get this, whose fault is that? Go back and look at the bills I've introduced in 15, in 16, and 17. It's conservative red meat, from term limits to reducing the size of the legislature. It's conservative in getting rid of taxes and regulatory burdens. It's conservative, and the establishment killed every one of them. Mm -hmm. Now, whose fault is that? They're punishing me for stepping out of line, but you know what? I'm sick of the line. It's the line that gave us $21 trillion in debt. It's the line in the good old boy machine that makes sure that none of us ever gets the crumbs they're begging for. It's the good old boy network that makes sure that Mississippi stays last while they always manage to find a way to have the money and the contracts and the friends and the donors, right? We're here to break up the good old boy club. That's what we're going to do. Now, that's why they dislike me. But guess what? I don't care. I don't care. This system has to be challenged at every level. If you're not challenging this system, you're part of the problem. And those other people that serve with me, their complicity and their silence, they are part of the problem. Either you value this state or you do not. You value this republic or you do not. And right now you cannot say that your Congress is serving your interest. Now, Trump is. He's fighting as well as he can under very difficult circumstances. We're happy to see that. But can you imagine what he could do if he just had a handful of strong fighters in the U.S. Senate? Chris, what can I tell them when they say, well, he won't bring money to the state of Mississippi. He's not experienced enough. Fed Cochran brought us money. Well, he ashamed us with that money. Well, i tell you something. That was, isn't it an amazing argument? How do I respond? Well, I mean, I, there's, there's several ways we can. <laughs> There's several ways we can. I think the first is this. We kept hearing that all that money was necessary. But then just a few months ago, we were being told our roads and bridges are falling in. Yeah. Yeah. Where's the money going then? How about this? Why don't we allow the people of Mississippi to keep that money in the first place? You see, it, it's, the, it's the strangest thing in the world to me when I hear people say that because the government comes into your pocketbook and takes your money by force. It then takes that money to Washington, D.C., and it keeps a finder's fee. What's the finder's fee? The cost of government, administrative and otherwise. Corruption, fraud, favoritism, cronies. Well, no, well, that's part of it too, right? A slush fund to cover up bad actors, right? The point is, is that you're not allowed to keep your money in the first place. So they take it to Washington, then they give you back a fraction of it with conditions attached to it. And they expect you to say, thank you, sir, I appreciate it. How about letting us keep it in the first place? How about let's keep it in the first place? And if this really is a question, if this really is a question, I want you to hear this for a second now. Now, is that Thad Cochran to get called? All right. If this really is a question of seniority, if it really is, if it really is a question of seniority and federal spending, why are we still dead last? Come on, let's talk about this for a minute. From, from all these senators with all this seniority and all this power and all this stroke, why are we still dead last? There's going something back, going back to Jim All the way back. And we're still dead last. Hey, there's something to that. There's something to that. Now let's talk about that for a second. This is a study I always talk about. I want you to hear it because it goes right to the heart of a possible cause and effect, which is why we're still economically speaking dead last. Harvard did a study a few years ago in 2010. Harvard was trying to prove that earmarks stimulated economic activity. This is why. They were trying, uh, you might remember the conservatives were trying to get rid of earmarks. Mm -hmm. And it was a close call. We didn't know if we could. Harvard was going to chime in and say, well, bad idea because it does stimulate local economies to spend federal dollars in those economies. So they studied it. Here's what they did. They followed senators and house members as they rose in seniority. As they rose in seniority, they were able to grab more dollars and more contracts for their respective states and districts, right? Guess what Harvard found, though? It depressed economic activity. It hurt economic activity. So they dug deeper. Why? The addiction of federal expenditures crowds out private investment. The addiction of federal expenditures invites corruption, where those that are corrupt and the cronies get most of those monies and the rest of us suffer. And number three, state legislatures don't, they're not proactive enough to create the environment for real economic growth, which depends on the free market more than it does government expenditures. Put it simply, Harvard would argue we're dead last because of an old system.
that we depend too much on federal expenditures. We depend too much on favoritism, on crawlies. We depend too much on Washington. That could explain it. Harvard says it does. My position is we've been dead last so long, let's give it another direction. Now, I said all morning, Joe, you can't predicate an economy or build an economy on the foundation of welfare. You just can't. Whether it's corporate welfare or individual welfare, that does not give people the prosperity they deserve and need. Only jobs can do that. Right. But government doesn't create jobs not without taking wealth from the people. The only real way to create jobs, real jobs, is the free market and the private sector. That's what we must do. Create the environment for private sector growth so we all can have jobs again. That's how Mississippi prospers. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Where do you stand on the Convention of the States? And I have a person that I was speaking to Saturday, and she said the only thing that she had right now that she didn't like that you didn't bring the uh, Convention of the State to the floor for a vote. Oh, she's wrong. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I didn't know how to okay. answer yes, it. Okay, yes, ma'am. I told her that I would it, talk it's a, to you and you would answer it, but if, okay. if, you, if you did, in fact, do that, you would have a good reason. Very good. I like you already. <laughs> now, here's what happened. I've introduced the resolution to help call for the convention, particularly on the balanced budget amendment, which I believe we need in this country. Mark Levin has offered 10 other amendments. And if you haven't read his book, The Liberty Amendments, I would suggest that you read it. It's very powerful, and it goes right to the heart of self-government and why the central government has gotten so big over the years. Well, I've introduced the resolution to call for a convention. It has to pass through committee first to get to the floor for a vote. I think the Mississippi House <laughs> passed it this past year. And the Rules Committee in the Senate, Terry Burton is the chairman of the Rules Committee in the Senate, he killed that bill without bringing it up for a vote. I didn't kill it, we wanted the bill passed. He killed it. Here's the way the system works. When a bill is assigned to a committee, the chairman has sole authority to bring it up or to let it die. And what happens is if he brings it up, there's a vote. If he just doesn't bring it up, the calendar, that is the elapse of time, kills it while it's still sitting in committee. Senator Burton, for whatever reason, decided not to bring it up. So the bill died in his committee. That's what happened. Now, I would like to see it passed. Here's why. Now, I realize there's some disagreement in conservative circles about the convention. I recognize that. And I'm, um, I'm sensitive to that. But there are enough oversights and enough fallback positions from a convention standpoint to prevent what's called a runaway convention and to make sure we can narrowly tailor the call to just a small number of issues. And even in the rare event that we did get to a runaway convention, all the states would still have to confirm or ratify and that wouldn't happen under those circumstances. I believe strongly that the present federal judiciary that we have has corrupted the federal constitution. I believe strongly that one decision after the other without congressional interference, which Congress should have stepped in, they did not. They've taken the original Constitution and they've twisted it upside down. Words that seem like common sense to us are redefined by federal judges. Meanings that seem like common sense to us are changed by federal judges. And what happens is the Constitution, therefore, is changed by judicial fiat, not by the amendment process. It's gotten so bad, I wouldn't mind seeing a delegation called to fight for the survival of the original Constitution. And even then, if we were to lose that, at the very least, we see now that the liberals aren't sincere about the original wording, and we can move forward with that understanding. But I, I, I wouldn't mind giving it a shot. Now, I'll be the first to tell you, I don't know that it would be successful, because I, I'm afraid the establishment is so strong, and their ability to appoint delegates are still so controlled by people like Haley, that people you would get sent to the convention will be controlled by the lobbyists and the moneyed interest. I doubt you'll get a lot of strict constitutionalists sent to the convention. And if that happens, it still fails. But it's still worth the conversation. It's still worth the fight. Let me back you up for a second. Did Senator Terry Burton, former Democrat Terry Burton, yes, sir. give an explanation of why he sat on it? No, sir. No, sir, he did not. He did not. Yes, Would you talk to this? <clears throat> There are a number of people who believe that we wouldn't be giving freebies away to illegal aliens. We would 
stop the attraction of illegal aliens coming here, that would automatically provide some border security. Sure. I, I agree with that, but I think there's a second way too. I think there's a second way. Jobs are a magnet as well. And we've got these big businesses that are more concerned about cheap labor than they are American workers. And you've seen that time and time and time again. Take the, um, the uh, Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Now bear in mind, the Chamber of Commerce in Flowood or Ellisville or Jackson, they're good people. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce is a different group altogether. It's a, it's, a, it's a group of multinational corporations who lobby for their exclusive interest. Those interests do not include you, our regular Mississippians. Top four Chamber of Commerce issues. One, amnesty for illegals. Number two, no border wall. Number three, they like uh, national uh, education standards like Common Core. And lastly, they love corporate welfare. So those are their big issues. Bear in mind, that at the end of the day, what they really desire is cheap labor, cheap labor for their companies. We know that when an illegal alien comes into Mississippi, he does uh, supplant or displace an American worker, a Mississippian that deserves that job. But there's another thing that occurs as well. Wages are deflated across the board, somewhere between seven and 15%. I've seen studies from 5% to 15%, but about 12, 13%, I guess, deflation across the board. The chamber loves that. Workers hate that. It's time we push back against the chamber and reestablish the right nature of things. And here's how you do that, Laura. Keep this in mind now. Our country, we put a man on the moon, didn't we? It's a pretty impressive feat. We did a lot of impressive things in this country. We have the ability to do anything, it seems, because we're not limited by government. We're allow creativity to flourish because of that. Here's an idea. Here's a database right here of all the so-called industry and others that have jobs that Americans won't do. Now, I, just, I don't believe that for a second. I wanna be clear. There's no job an American won't do. Now, we may not like it, but if you have to do it, you do it. That's called a job, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, here are the jobs that all these industries say they need that Americans won't do. Database. Here's a database of the millions of Americans presently on public assistance. Okay? These are able-bodied people that are sitting at home and they're milking the welfare system, are they not? You merge the databases. You use their zip codes, their geographical locations, their GPS. You know exactly where they're located. There's an industry seven miles away. The industry tenders a job offer for Monday morning at nine o'clock. If that person doesn't show up, guess what? No more welfare. See, it's that simple. So it begs the question, why haven't they done it? Here's why. In the back rooms, when they all meet, they have a lot more in common than they claim. Yeah. On this particular issue, the Republicans want cheap labor at your expense. The Democrats want new voters at your expense. We, the American people, lose because they're colluding. That's why. We can fix it. You can fix it. I'm gonna tell you something. If you're on the welfare system and you're able-bodied and you're offered a job, less than 10 miles away, if you don't show up for that job, you're out of here. Right. You're out of here. Love that will fix the system. I think that's that that scenario right there is what kills personal industry, meaning personal incentive to get to work and put yourself on your own two feet. I think that right there is a very serious problem in our culture. Yeah. It's not individuals, it's our culture. And what, what people don't realize, I think, is it's a gift to the recipients. It's not punitive at all. It's helping it them is. start to build their lives. That's a perfect answer because it not only gives them a job, it gives them upward mobility. Absolutely. You see, we don't just want jobs, we want upward mobility. Absolutely. Welfare never gives you upward mobility, it keeps you. It's trapped in a system, corporate welfare and individual welfare. You want upper mobility, only the free market can provide that. So that would cut off that magnet of jobs to make sure these citizens were working and not the rest of the world. We can't employ the rest of the world. We can't. We can't feed the rest of the world. Now there's nothing wrong with charity. You should be charitable. 
And if you want to give your money to someone overseas, that's a wonderful thing to do if your heart tells you to do that. But in our country, we have a social compact with American citizens. We have a social contract with American citizens. If there's a single little girl tonight who's hungry in Detroit, we can't feed the rest of the world. If there's a little boy somewhere in New Orleans that needs clothing and shelter, we can't clothe and shelter with the rest of the world. America has to come first. These are our people that are suffering. Right. Right. That goes, one more thing, I'll come to you, Mel. $51 billion this year we'll spend on foreign aid to countries that hate our guts. $51 billion. Yet we could build a border wall for only $25 billion one-time cost. Come on, folks, we've got the money. Our politicians aren't prioritizing the expenditures. We have to put America first. Yes, ma'am. I still think if you cut off the freedoms, the Medicaid, the food stamps, and the welfare, see, we keep them living while they work and send all their money back to wherever they come from. We wouldn't need a wall if we did that. Well, that, that certainly is part of it. I'll tell you something else. Texas, a few years ago, this is kind of a weird thing that nobody talks about anymore. Texas, back in the early 80s, passed a law because they had a serious illegal immigration problem in Texas, as you can imagine. They passed a law and said, listen, um, you come to this country illegally, no public education for you. Think about it. Elementary school, whatever, high school. Well, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, if you're here illegally, why should taxpayer dollars go to educate you from another country? The United States Supreme Court invalidated that law and they made Texas use public resources to educate these people from other countries. Now, I want to be clear about something. Half my family is Irish, half are Scottish. I don't care. I don't care what the country of origin is. If you don't come here legally, you're not welcome. Amen. You're not welcome. Right. You're not welcome. Amen. And that comes from a people, you know, you might recall the Irish in the 1800s when they came here, they were not welcome here. <laughs> I remember that. I've got a sign at home I hang up. I remind my sons about it all the time. It was a sign from Massachusetts. And uh, it said simply, Irish need not apply. <laughs> Those are our people. But I'm not going to sit back and be mad about it. That's not the Irish way. We got to work. You fight, you get to work. Sometimes you gotta just take it, right? There's always gonna be resistance in what you do. You do it the right way, you do it legally. And what do we do? We became police officers and firemen. And we worked our tails off doing jobs nobody else wanted to do. And then we kept fighting, and we kept fighting, and we kept fighting. That's how people become successful. America gives you that chance. America gives you that chance. And that's why it's such a special country. You know, you come here, you face some resistance, that's okay. Keep fighting, keep working. God has a plan. If you work hard enough, you make it. That's how I was taught. So I hang that sign so my boys can see it. And they say, what does that mean, Daddy? I say, well, it means you just have something. You have to go take it. You have to fight sometimes, right? I love that part of this country. So with all that being said, we got to take care of each other first. We can't take care of the rest of the world. Okay, I'm coming to you. I'm, I'm sorry. All right. One more question. Yes. Uh, these big companies, for instance, AT&T, they outsource their customer service. You try to get in touch with them about your, your phone bill, your your direct TV, your, uh, your internet, whatever. You go to uh, Iran, India, Mexico, <laughs> India, yeah. everywhere. They don't understand you and they no. say, yes, 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 we can do this and we can do that. And we're we're going to do this and this is going to happen. And then you get your bill in and oh my gosh, it did not happen. I fought literally myself, fought with them for over a year over DSL and internet. Right. And it was all because I could never talk to a person in the United States that knew anything about anything. What can we do, what can you do to get rid of to get rid of that? I tell you, there might be certain things we can do, and it might surprise you, the, uh, the things we can accomplish there. It may not be necessary to mandate that corporations uh, not outsource. It might be simply necessary to stop regulating corporations so much when they feel the need to outsource. Sometimes we tax them too much, we regulate their businesses too much, and they feel the need to find other ways to find uh, loopholes around the tax laws and other things. You know, it's ridiculous. They charge us all these little dollar 
or if you sent things to our bill, those little charges are as much as our phone bill is. Right, right, absolutely. What else y'all got? Anything? This is fun. I think I'm running people off now. No, you ain't running nobody off. They have Daniel shirts on. That's good. <laughs> it's on my little anyway. They're already convinced. I, I want everybody to know, okay, from your words, I, I can't answer this because I can't remember it all. <laughs> you defended the governor. I lost it. Yes. Is that not right? I was the lawyer for How, how yeah. about explaining that? Okay. Yeah, let me talk about that. You might remember Mississippi has an attorney general that refused to file a lawsuit against Obamacare. Yes. I wonder why. He was a Democrat, <laughs> just like Cindy was a Democrat. Yeah. Okay, I'm pretty sure Cindy helped him get elected. He wouldn't file a lawsuit against Obamacare. So somebody had to. So I did, and I was Governor Bryant's lawyer in the file a suit against Obamacare. Our firm did that free of charge. We didn't charge a dime. It took a lot of man hours to get there, but we did it free of charge. And uh, Governor Bryant uh, was a petitioner or a plaintiff in that case. I guess that makes me a trial lawyer. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. <laughs> Here's the thing. So I sue Barack Obama, right? That's a good trial lawyer there, right? I feel sue Barack Obama. Uh, but um, and I think, uh, you know, there were other defendants there, but... We, we fought it along with the other states, and then the decision came down on my birthday, which was weird, you know. It's like a, here I'm having a pretty good day at the office, and here comes the decision. How to get wind of it. And you're going to love this, because I, now get this, not to get too boring about constitutional law, but I can tell you pretty much across the board, we were all under the same opinion that the big fight was going to be over the Commerce Clause. And the reason for that is that the, the Congress has used the Commerce Clause a bunch of times over the last 80 years to justify every conceivable legislation. And they do it in a weird way. Because remember now, Article 1, Section 8 gives the federal government every power it's supposed to have. And so when these lawyers in the Senate and the House are looking at powers to justify, they'll say, yeah, yeah, here, oh, commerce. This impacts commerce. And what they'll argue is, even a law that seems entirely local, if you uh, apply inference over inference, you argue that, oh, it affects interstate commerce, which is the argument they've always made. And only one decision in the last 80 or so years has ever restricted the Commerce Clause even a little bit. So the big fight we thought was on the Commerce Clause. Leave it to me, right? I just knew that was the issue. And so I see the opinion come down, and I really wasn't paying close attention, but I knew Roberts was right in the majority. And I read the first few pages, and he was basically saying the Commerce Clause wasn't sufficient. In other words, you could not use it to justify Obamacare, the individual mandate. I thought we won. It's a big mistake. You should read the whole opinion, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so I jump on Twitter. I'm like, take that, Barack Obama, right? <laughs> and somebody says, you might want to read the rest of the opinion. <laughs> and uh, I kept reading it. And leave it to Justice Roberts, who's supposed to be a conservative. But he was too busy trying to protect his own legacy on the court that he had to get too clever by half. He got really cute with his opinion. So he finds that the Commerce Clause isn't sufficient to justify the individual mandate. And then he moves to the taxing power. I want you to know something. In oral argument, almost no time was discussed on the taxing power being sufficient for the individual mandate. Nobody thought that was the case. Nobody. Here's why. We all understand in our system that the federal government is limited in its authority. As a result, any power that's absolute must be by definition unconstitutional. If it can order you to do something, Don, and then tax you if you don't, that's an unlimited power. Scalia asked from the bench, he goes, so you're telling me that if, you or if the government orders me to eat broccoli three times a day, I'll have to do it or pay a tax? They had to concede, yeah. Now that's a government with unlimited power. It's what that is. Our founders would, would never have recognized that concept. So here we are ordering American people to purchase a product they don't want. Yeah. That is to engage in commerce that they don't want to engage in. And they found this power justified under the taxing authority. So I read it and I was just, I was blown away. Because here this conservative, Roberts, is writing an opinion justifying this nonsense. But Kennedy, who is always the guy jumping back and forth, writes the dissent, and it's wonderfully done. 
it was an abuse of power. That goes to my next point. The federal courts are broken. Thank God for Donald Trump. Thank God for Gorsuch. Thank God for Kavanaugh. Thank God things are about to change a bit. Yes. But up until this point in our history, we've seen a Supreme Court that's completely out of control. Yeah. And I want to be clear about this. I want to be clear about this. They are not the sole arbiters of constitutionality. At some point, the people have to reclaim some of that power. I'm sick of nine justices telling me what I can and can't do. Yes. Yes. I'm sick of that. That's Congress's power, not theirs. They're not designed to create laws. That's exactly what Justice Roberts did when he rewrote Obamacare to justify it under the taxing authority. It's unconstitutional by definition. We're not gonna forget that. It's not gonna forget that. While I'm, while I'm complaining about this now, I wanna be clear about something. Roe versus Wade is just as problematic. It's just as problematic. It's bad enough that it allows abortion, but it rewrote the law to allow abortion. Not just in the application of the substance due process, but it actually imposed trimester situations in the, in, the, in the law. Think about that. The Roe Court wrote an opinion that created a trimester breakdown of what the state could do and couldn't do at a particular time. That's a legislative decision, not a judicial decision. And at the time when it was decided, even liberal jurists, even liberal professors thought it went too far. And yet now the liberals say it's inviolate. It can never be reversed. Yes, it can and it should be. And the first time we're going to test these new justices, they need to get that opinion before them because that was badly decided law. Roe essentially took the powers to regulate away from the states. You only do that with what's called fundamental rights. How can you claim abortion to be a fundamental right when A, it's not listed in the Constitution, but B, it's not deeply rooted in our nation's history or traditions? How do we know that? Because at the time, almost every state had outlawed abortion. Long story short, it should be reversed. Those powers belong to the states to decide. Mississippi has to make decisions for itself. California has to make decisions for itself. But it's not the place of nine unelected lawyers to make that decision. Jefferson would have been outraged. He thought Mark Burr versus Madison was too much. Look, we gotta push back. And Congress can, they just haven't. How do they do it? You know they can remove federal jurisdiction? In other words, federal courts can only hear a handful, a number of things. Congress could remove the issue away from the federal courts where they don't have power over that any longer. You can remove federal jurisdiction. Number two, you can impeach justices and courts that break outside of the constitutional boundaries. Why wouldn't we? You impeach the right one, a whole bunch of others will fall into line, won't they? I'm tired of being ruled by men in black robes. Yeah. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. The People's Branch has been powerless because of it. Yeah, I'm going to ask you first a couple of questions. First of all, I want to thank you for not having the negative ads and the, the horrible things that we see on those that are against you. Yes, I think that's deplorable and it's not right. Secondly, I want to ask, because I don't know you very well, I want to ask about your faith. I, we are, most of the people in Mississippi are people of strong faith, and I am yes. one. I would just like to know where you stand. I don't care what church you go to or what denomination you are. I want to know what your relationship is with the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. I, uh, I am a guy, I was, I was saved when I was 13 years old. And I'll tell you that story real quick. And I, um, I, I went to the church at a little Southern Baptist church in Ellisville. And um, I always tell people that if you haven't felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit, <coughs> you don't know what anguish is, right? <laughs> right? And so, you know, you grow up in a church your whole life and you're in Sunday school every day and you're Wednesdays. My dad never missed. He was a deacon in the church and he thought it was very important that we never miss any church. So you're always around it. But then I get to be about 12, 12 and a half, and I start feeling this ache, right? This anxiety. I couldn't put a finger on it, but I began to recognize what it was. I was coming to the conclusion that I was a sinner and that I was destined for hell without salvation. And that's a tough thing for a kid to, to understand, but even more so, I was petrified by the notion of even walking down the aisle. This may shock some of you, but I used to be a little shy when I was a kid. <laughs> And so I'm, um, I'm 13 years old now, and I'm at this church, and my dad has been talking to me about it a little bit. Well, church ends, and I go home. At this stage, I'm in serious anguish, and I, I have to do something. 
again, if you've ever been touched by the Holy Spirit in that way, you know some relief has to come. This is bad. I still didn't know quite how to do it, so I went back in the back. My bedroom was in the back of the house, and I just went close the door, and I just covered up. Now, I'm 13 years old. It's a beautiful day outside. I'm laying back in the back. I'm just covered up. My dad gets wind of it. He comes back. He says, hey, hey, what are you doing? Oh, nothing. I just I don't feel good. He says, come on, what are, you, what are you doing back here? You know, the good thing about daddies and mommies, they, know, they sometimes know these things as they're occurring. But he just he talked to me. And I, I told him, and he led me to Christ at that moment. And that was, uh, that was a, um, uh, a defining moment in my life for many different reasons. Um, that story continues, and I've told the story a few times. I don't mind telling you all. Most of you have heard it. Um, but I want you to hear this as well. I have two salvation experiences. And you say, for a Baptist, how's that even possible, right? <laughs> uh, one was spiritual when I was 13. The other was uh, emotional, spiritual, and physical when I was much older. Uh, 1999, I'm a federal law clerk, which is a really cool position. It's akin to a surgical residency. It's one of those rare things that come available. And I was fortunate enough to, to, to land it. And I still to this day, I'm not sure how I did, but I was very pleased to be there. It's a two-year uh, clerkship. And I was nearing the end of it. And so my life was about to transition. And uh, I was engaged to be married. And uh, the wedding was just a few days away. You're in that stage where you're transitioning to adulthood. Marriage, a new job, a law firm, what I'd always wanted, what I'd worked so hard for my entire life. And then things have a way of changing. I went to, you know, if you want God to laugh, she's telling your plans, right? <laughs> well, my father decided that he wanted a brand new car. And, uh, you know, that didn't happen a whole lot for our family. We weren't wealthy. He was a professor. My, both my parents were study employees, and so uh, we only did this once every few years, so for us it was a really big deal. And he was also, because he was such a good person, he, he did not like controversy. Turns out his son didn't mind it so much. <laughs> Thank you. You're right, right. And he asked me to, um, to go with him to Jackson and help him negotiate uh, the price of a new car so he could purchase it. And um, the idea was I would leave Hattiesburg, come to Collins and meet. He would leave Ellisville, meet me in Collins. We met downtown, right there where he grew up. He grew up in Co downtown Collins there. And I uh, jumped in the car with him, we took off. And sure enough, we spent, you know how it is, you spend all these hours negotiating with uh, these dealers and they're, they're tough, they're tough. And so we did it, finally got the deal done and uh, he was really proud, you know, he had him a new car and everything was fine. And we decided to head back toward, uh, toward home. When we got to Collins and that's where he was gonna drop me off and I was gonna follow him back home. I still lived with my parents at the time. And um, that's when everything changed. You know, he, uh, he told me he loved me and hugged me and everything was fine. You know, there's no way to predict um, any of the things that were about to happen. So we got on 588. 588 is a small two lane road that connects Collins to Ellisville. It's a road that we've been on our entire lives. Uh, both my mom's family was from Collins and my dad's family was from Collins. And so we had spent, been on 588 as long as I've been alive and every Christmas, every Thanksgiving, so it was well traveled for us. And uh, we were just a few miles down it. And a truck pulled out. He hit it. And, uh, I had to um, take my car over to the side of the ditch. I wrecked it in the ditch. And uh, I ran out to try to get to him. He was trapped inside the, the car. And I had to break open the door, the glass, to get into it. Cut me up. Told him I loved him. 
kissed him. He died. He died right in my arms. I still smell for gasoline. It was inexplicable. It was a tragedy I never imagined. So for a couple of years, I uh, I challenged everything. You know, why did God allow this to happen? Why do I have to see it? Why do I have to live with the memory still? It, um, it led me down some weird paths. I mean, nothing bad. I just fell away from all those foundational principles that he had taught me. I then turned to C.S. Lewis, a Christian apologetic, a writer. And I began to understand pain and why it existed and it was a calling card. And he once argued that the greatest evidence we have of a creator is pain. Because without it, you'd never look up. Amen. And um, he called that the programming. That is, we're programmed to look up, always searching. He says, we're not comfortable here because this is not our home. We're only passing through. And that stuck with me. And after all that time and all that pain, that foundation my father helped build for me when I was 13, I came back home to it. And um, the reason that story matters to you, I think, and me, I, I know, is that I've seen the worst thing a person can see, at least from my perspective. I thought he was the greatest human ever. He was the best daddy ever. And once you go to those levels, once you've seen that, I can assure you there's nothing that Mitchell McConnell can do to hurt me. There's nothing Washington can do to hurt me. All this junk they say about me, all these accusations, that's nothing. I have seen the worst thing a person can see. So when I tell them to bring it, I'm dead serious. They can't hurt me. They can't touch me. I've seen the worst. And everything else is uphill from there. So it built a different Chris. Uh, the old one died that night. He died on the side of that road. He's still there somewhere. But the new one came out a lot tougher and a lot more convicted. And I'll be the first to tell you, despite all of that, there are no perfect people. Amen. Amen. And I see it. I see it every day. I see it every day. But I know at the end of the day that I have a Redeemer and I have salvation. And I ask for forgiveness every night. And it's like that same load that was lifted when I was 13. I feel it left every night before I go to bed. And if you don't have that, you should find it because there's no other answer in the world that can solve your problems than that. Right. And yet, conservatives, and I want to be clear about this, I want to come full circle here. The day you put all your trust in a person is the day you're no longer a conservative. That's right. Right. That's right. The day you put all your trust in a politician, you are not a conservative anymore. At the core of our philosophy is this. We all recognize each other as flawed, but unique and very special people. Because we're flawed, we don't believe any other should rule us. Does that make sense? Because we're flawed, we shouldn't rule them. Because they're flawed, they shouldn't rule us. That's the essence of liberty that's established by our founders, and that's what we fight for today. Excuse me while I couldn't tell the story and I, I even hesitate to tell it now because invariably somebody will claim it's being used or utilized for bad purposes but that's who I am and it has defined every part of me 
and the, those are the two instances of my life that defined me. And you know, it was such a weird story in that, I'll tell you something else about life, and this is getting real personal, but I don't mind. I've, I've told you all before, whatever your question is, no matter how personal, I'll answer it. Um, my mom and dad were incredibly close. Um, you won't believe it when I tell you, but they were childhood sweethearts. And they got married very early. And he went to play college basketball, and she stayed right there with him the whole time. And they were so close that they were inseparable. And you say, what does that really mean in practice? Well, they worked in the same institution, and he would drive her to work every morning, and then he would go work. And at 4.30 in the evening, he'd be sitting right there waiting for her to come out. She never held a driver's license. Oh. <laughs> wow. That's how close they were, because if they were shopping, he took her shopping. If they were going to a movie, he took her to the movie. If they were going to pick me up to watch a ball game, he was taking her. Now, the strange thing about it is I thought that's the way all couples were. <laughs> and, right? And I was thinking, you know, and I, I also, something else got me about life. You know, you grew up in this very sheltered household. My dad and my mom, it was all very sheltered. I mean, there was no beer at all. That we were at church every time it opened. I thought that's the way everybody was. And then, not that there's anything wrong with beer, Judge Kavanaugh loves beer. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he said it, not me. I'm not going to get in trouble for that one. He said it. That was some, that was some good testimony. Um, okay, so my dad was such a good guy. And you know, we always idealize our parents just a bit, right? We always put them on a pedestal, especially when we lose them. But I can tell you this unequivocally, and I would tell you otherwise if it were not the case, I never heard him say a negative word about another human being. I never heard him say a cuss word. Now, you know, you know, I can't say the same about myself. <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. It's a Sunday ritual. <laughs> I'm so, and that's why I'm a Cubs fan, right? But what's funny about this, you grew up in this really neat household, right, where there's, it really is, with the, the, the most risque thing we watched was Happy Days, right? <laughs> and then I went to law school. Oh. And it's like, wow, this is the world. And so I was shaped in large part by all of that. But I tell you this, I never left those foundations. Mm -hmm. Even though they've been challenged from time to time, I always return to them. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. Chris, those who know you, Somehow, often describe you as something steady, something sure. Would you tell us where that comes from? Yeah, thank you. That goes back to my dad again. If you've, um, have you ever been to the Great Smoky Mountain National Park? Oh, yeah. Yes. All right. You know, when I was a kid, that was my dad's favorite vacation spot. So it became our family vacation spot. Now, when you're a professor and your mom also works for the state, we didn't have a lot of money. It's funny, though, because we didn't know. And if you don't know you're broke, it doesn't matter, right? I had a, everything I owned was in a cardboard box in my, uh, in my closet. And it was like a glove and a baseball and a basketball and a football. I thought that was just all the toys a person had, right? But my dad, he really loved the Great Smoky Mountains. And if you've never been, there's a reason for that. It really is an incredible spot. You know, you drive into this place, and the mountains are so beautiful and lush, and then as you're driving down these little mountain roads, you can look down to the left and the right. There are streams, these little mountain streams. And so one of the things we always did, I always wanted to go down and play next to the stream. And so sure enough, we found a place to pull over. He would take me down there. And one of the games we developed over the years was is that, have you seen those big gray rocks in the streams? Yeah. Big gray rocks. And they're sporadically placed in, uh, by nature in all these places in these streams. And the idea was is to, to jump from rock to rock yeah, right? It's a cool game. You jump from rock to rock and try to get to the other side. Well, I was down there with him, and I was just a little boy. And um, I was doing my rock jumping. And sure enough, something happened, and I fell in. And it's a story you may have heard before. I thought that I was drowning. Water's cold. I was scared. And I remember thinking, you know, this is horrible. And I, uh, he, he rushes over and he grabs me and he picks me up. And I'm, I'm crying. I'm really upset. He says, son, are you okay? And I said, yes, sir. And that's when he told me. He goes, son, always look for something steady, something sure. Oh. 
And when I was 13, that was the last, that was the thing he said before he led me to Christ. He said, now it's time to find something steady, something sure. And so that always stayed with me the rest of my life. And I try to always return to those footings and foundations. Even when things get rocky, you know, you, you always try to find it. And the, I love the story. It, it didn't dawn on me at the time. It was teaching me about life. You know, sometimes people fall. But if you can find that solid and sure, you can always stagger back to your feet and get ready to go again, right? Sometimes republics fall. But if you can find that solid and sure, you can find your footing again and stand again. Life is a series of mistakes, but we find our solid footing again. We're back in the fight. That was an important part of my life. And so something steady, something sure has been with me ever since. Yeah, that was a big deal. It all starts with those rocks right there in, in uh, Tennessee. Yeah, and those rocks are really solid and steady most of the time. I just said a bad one, evidently. <laughs> you got anything else for me? I'll start wrapping up if you don't. Chris, I just want to say that's the definition of a rock solid. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. It took a while to get there, but we made it, didn't we? Yeah. That's good. Thank you for saying that. I, um, let me just begin to wrap up. and I'll, um, This is, the, to me, the most important part of why I, uh, I started all this in the first place. And it has nothing to do with a single sentence. Do you know that, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. All right. Everything that we do in life sometimes revolves around single races. Single race here, single presidential race, single Senate race. I'm gonna tell you something about politics and life and government. Nothing will ever change until you all engage the system. That doesn't always mean with the passage of laws. It means the culture, the political body, things that occur in your average lives, your daily lives, that's how great countries are made. Reagan used to call it the common man, but it's really the uncommon man, the uncommon woman. That's the special part of this country. Put simply, all the powers of government belong to the people. There is no great repository of knowledge that falls from the sky when a politician is elected. And we shouldn't treat him or her as such. All powers belong to the people. The job and the role of a politician is to protect that liberty at all costs. And he does that or she does that by giving those powers back to the people whenever he or she can. Barry Goldwater said years ago, the change will come when you entrust people with these positions of power who promise to give back the power they've been given. That's a profound statement. That's taxing policy, it's domestic policy, and everything that we do, we give back the power to the people. That's the American ideal. Self-government, self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and liberty. What we've done over the years as individuals, we have forgotten that. When we got busy with our lives, and we decided that Washington could solve all of our problems for us. And it's the most ill-equipped government to solve problems imaginable. It's too far away. The country's too diverse. The problems that we're addressed with can't be fixed with a simple passage of legislation. It takes something more. Conservatives recognize the spiritual side of men and women. We don't just see you as material. You're something more. We know the human heart drives politics, not the other way around. We know that people configured on the ground drives politics, not the other way around. Stop looking for a top-down approach to your problems. You have to look for a ground-up approach to your problems. It's not the government's place to solve them. It's your place to solve them. Your family's place to solve them. Your church's place to solve them. Other civic organizations and groups, but not a government a thousand miles away in a distant, far-off capital. Now, I say all that to point out only you can change this now. You put too much trust in a politician, you will be let down. You put too much faith in a system, you will be let down. Only the people of this country, working together, can solve the problem. Washington is corrupt. It's incorrigible. It's broken. It's not listening. It won't change from a top-down approach. You have to force the change from the bottom up. That's a heavy responsibility to bear. And here's the thing. You're fighting for the survival of freedom, a free republic. If we fail here, where will free people go? 
This is it. This is it. If we fail in this experiment, where will free people go? So you look at it in that context and you recognize this is a heavy responsibility for this generation. But there have been other generations that bore heavier responsibilities. From the birth of a country to the defeat of evil. We've always had generations that would rise at the right time and this is one of those moments. Thank God for President Trump. He's still the tide for a moment. But he can't hold it back unless he has help. And that's not from Congress necessarily, it's from you. Here's the challenge. You will be judged one day by the high court of history. I believe that with everything in my heart. The first question deals with what we discussed earlier. It's your salvation experience. If you don't get that one right, nothing else really matters. But there are others. You cannot be given a government of this magnitude, a country this special. Our Constitution was touched by the hand of God. Make no mistake about it. Amen. Amen. The Declaration of Independence was touched by the hand of God. What those founders did was impossible without divine intervention. Amen. Now, we've been given this guilt through divine intervention. If we fail, we're going to have to answer for it. I think one of the questions is, were you men and women of courage? When the going got tough, when the world pushed back, what did you do? When he challenged the establishment, when he challenged the status quo, all the lobbyists and the money changers and the cronies and the insiders and the backroom deals, when you challenged that, they pushed back. And it hurt. They attacked your family. They libeled you. They slandered you. Jobs may be lost. Friendships may be lost. But it's a small price to pay in the overall scheme of history. It's a small price to pay to restore a republic that we must restore in this generation. There's nowhere else for us to go. We have nothing left to compromise with these people. We have nothing left to surrender to the American left. They've taken everything. Now we stop. And we draw a line in the sand and we say no more. That takes courage because it's going to hurt. That's part of what brave people do. They experience and they persevere. Number two, were you men and women of judgment? This is important to me because the decisions you make today will invariably impact the lives of my children. Yes. So I have a real interest in you tonight. Stop thinking about these things in terms of two-year cycles and four-year cycles. Reject all the talking heads on TV. This isn't a political decision you're making. It's a cultural decision you're making. Think of things in terms of 20-year cycles. If you don't engage the culture today, engage the system today, 20 years from now, what type of country will mind your children inherit? See, the decisions you made tonight will impact their futures. That's why I can't have you leave here without at least challenging you for a second. I told you at Neshova, you may turn away from these words, but you can never again say you didn't know. You have a country to save, and it has to begin tonight in everything that you do. My kids deserve that. Your kids deserve my action as well. That's judgment. Number three? Yeah. Integrity. Were you men and women of integrity? This is a hard part for Christians. It goes back to what we were talking about a minute ago. We sometimes believe integrity means perfection. It does not. If that were the case, we'd all be silenced. Here's integrity. Integrity recognizes we're imperfect. It recognizes our flaws and transgressions. But it also recognizes a redeemer. Here's the best part about having salvation. When you do repent of your sins and you get that forgiveness, you can drop that bag of bricks forever. And once you drop that bag of bricks, your mission becomes very clear. You're the salt and the light. That's what Matthew tells us, right? Mm -hmm. You're the salt and the light. Now, why is this important? Integrity demands that you're able to put aside the past to focus on the future. It demands it because the American left wants you silenced. They want you in that corner second-guessing yourself. They want you wondering if you're good enough, if your God is good enough. They mock you. They ridicule you, and they tell you that you shouldn't be involved. You've heard them say it. Christians shouldn't be involved in politics. I'm going to tell you, we should have never left politics in the first place. So integrity recognizes our flaws, but enables us to gain our salvation and our redemption. Drop that bag of bricks and learn to fight. 
Now this gets me fired up because I'm going to tell you something. This is your country. You've been pushed around long enough. You've been mocked long enough. Fight back. Amen. Fight back like you mean it. Who do they think they are? All their degrees and all that power they think they possess. They know nothing. And they've underestimated the greatest force in politics. They've underestimated you. Fight them. Push back against them. Make them hear you. That's integrity. And lastly, we're you men and women of dedication. Liberalism doesn't come overnight. It's tricky. It comes subtly, incrementally over time. It's a paper cut here, a paper cut there. Like waves against the shore, it buries eventually the very foundation you once built. 70 years we've been fighting this mindset. 70 years of change and corruption. 70 years of pushing this so-called progressive agenda. It's not progressive at all. There's nothing progressive about the individual being placed under the mechanisms of government. That's the opposite of enlightenment. Enlightenment is to empower you at the expense of government. That's who we are. Don't fall for their tricks. 70 years until we've barely recognized this country. Dedication means it may take us 70 years to get it back. But that fight has to begin today. Now, this is hard for conservatives because you've been down this path before. You think the change comes quickly. It doesn't. It comes incrementally. We have to learn to engage for the long haul. So next week when you wake up and things seem bitter, or things seem like they haven't changed, you fight. Next year, if things still see the same, you fight. 10 years from now, you still feel like we're not quite there, you fight. There will be a breakthrough because the message survives. If the message of conservatism survives, if the message of liberty survives, if the love of liberty survives, young people will rush toward it. And we will save this country, but only if we engage without apologizing for it. Oh no, our days of apologizing have ended. This is our country. And we're going to fight for it. And we're going to keep it and we're going to preserve it for the sake of our kids. That's the dedication I'm speaking of. Now with that said, you are those people. You may not know you're those people, but you're those people. And you harbor the same doubts that other great people have harbored over the years. Can we do this? I feel like I'm all alone, right? People are so hostile. The American revolutionaries at the time of the revolution only had the popular support of about 33% of the population. But there was a Thomas Paine, and there was a Jefferson, there was a Madison and an Adams, and they were having meetings just like this, and all of a sudden people were being awakened to the fact that tyranny wasn't our friend. And all of a sudden, a nation was born. You're in those days again. You're in those days right now. What will you do with this opportunity? I wouldn't change places with anybody else in the history of the world. This is the greatest moment we've had in a long, long time. Tyranny or liberty? Reagan once said, there's no right or left. There's no right or left. There's up toward liberty or down toward tyranny. That's, right. and that's where we are. If you engage this system and you do it the right way, you tell your neighbors and your friends, you knock on those doors and you make those phone calls, not just for this race, but for every race. And not just for politics, but for the culture. You win. And one day we'll look back on these days, won't we? I'm looking forward to that. I'm tired. It'd be nice to sit on a rocking chair somewhere, look back, and think about 15 and 16 and 17 and 18 and all you good people. And see my sons grown to honorable adulthood playing with their boys and girls in the yard. And remember these were the days that saved the country. That's who we are. Now, take that fight outside. Let's get it done, okay? Thank you. I'm supporting Chris McDaniel as our next senator. And I was making a pitch before you came in, uh, Senator, and I'll finish the pitch very quickly because I know we're all ready to go. But now you see, and now you know, understand what it takes. Chris and I have a lot in common. 
Uh, well, other than obvious good looks and intelligence. <laughs> but we have a, a great deal in common because of the heart. You see he spoke from the heart. Yeah. And you hear it's going to take sacrifice. And I know people in this room have already sacrificed. They did it for four years ago, and you're sitting here today to do it again. Gail and the sign waivers are out there sweating like crazy. The door knockers that have been going and going and going with sore feet, they're out there going strong. You're giving up your time tonight. There are people here, aches with uh, arthritis, but you're here because you care. Mr. Wesley, put on a uniform willing to die for his country. Yeah. Tonight you're here because you want to continue the republic. You want to resurrect the republic. We had a Reagan, now we've got a Chris McDaniel, and it's going to take money to get him where he needs right. to be, yes. folks. Make your checks out to friends of Chris McDaniel or put some cash in Stafford's hands. Sacrifice, give what you can, and God bless you for being here. Thank you.